Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Hicks, and welcome here to the ongoing Greenway Chambers CPD series. Uh, today, we're looking at claims under Part 3, 1 of the Fair Work Act. And I'm joined today by Penny Thu, who's going to be the principal presenter, together with Fahim Anwar and Ashley Cameron. Now, Penny's been at the bar since 2005, practising in the area of uh, commercial law, but with a special focus on employment law and in particular claims of this kind. Uh, Fahim uh, has been at the bar for less time, uh, having completed his readership recently and is now practising again in the area of uh, commercial law uh, with a focus not only on employment but also uh, general industrial matters and uh, infrastructure and construction law. Ashley Cameron shares a similar interest and perspective in terms of her practice, which is in commercial law, uh, with a focus on these matters of employment and industrial uh, claims, together with infrastructure and construction disputes. If I could start with calling on Penny to describe to us uh, these claims and what's been occurring uh, in this area in the last little while. Penny, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Good afternoon. We will look at uh, some common claims that are made under Part 3.1 of the Fair Work Act today. The first kind of claim commonly made that we will consider today uh, is the uh, uh, claims alleging adverse action taken because of an employee having or exercising a workplace right and the specific workplace right that we will be considering is the workplace right defined in section 341 1 subsection c roman 2. so the protection itself as everyone no doubt knows is contained in section 340 but the definition of this particular workplace right is contained in section 341 subsection c subsection uh, roman 2. Um, the second kind of claim that we will Thank you. That we will consider today is uh, a claim made pursuant to section 351 of the Fair Work Act, which is a section entitled discrimination. However, it is structured quite differently to anti-discrimination legislation. As you no doubt know, section 351 contains specified grounds such as sex, race, age, disability, political opinion and carers responsibilities, among many other grounds, and adverse action is prescribed on each of these grounds. We will have a look at what is and what is not adverse action, and we will have a look at the causal nexus created by the words because of in each of the sections and how these words tie in with the rebuttable presumption under section 361. We will also look at the evidence required to rebut the presumption and finally on the limits of compensation as well as the recent decision of Rue Hazardigan and Technology One in which what appears to be an unprecedented award of damages in the sum of almost $5.2 million plus penalties was awarded. Finally, we will have a look briefly at the recent full court decision as well in Coles Supply Chain and Milford in which the full court made a finding that where there is a dismissal is a, whether there is a dismissal is a jurisdictional question that must be decided, not at any later stage, but where there is dispute over that issue, it needs to be decided at the point at which the application is filed with the Fair Work Commission under Section 365 of the Act. And if there is no dismissal, that means that the court or the Fair Work Commission and then the court has no jurisdiction. So that is a, um, an issue, a question that must be determined immediately where there is a dispute about it and the full court importantly said that where there are no procedures in place currently within the Fair Work Commission for such a jurisdictional objection to be lodged by an employer respondent, then those procedures must be put in place by the Fair Work Commission in the form of a rule. And what that means is now there is an, a jurisdictional objection, a further jurisdictional objection that can be made by employers on that basis. And I will we'll have a look at that more fulsomely. Ash, um, Ashley will go to that in a moment, but, and then I'll come back to that at the conclusion of today's talk. Um, and now I will hand you over to Fahim. Thanks very much, Fahim. Thank you very much, Penny. So I will start by providing an introduction to general protection claims. Now, I should say the early part of this presentation will be a bit of a refresher for those of you who are specialists in this area. 
But on the other hand, we hope that if you are relatively new to this area and don't have a lot of experience, it will give you a solid foundation before we start to discuss the more recent authorities. Now, to begin with, a key thing to remember about general protection cases is that the focus of the inquiry is on the reason why an adverse action like dismissal, for example, was taken, rather than whether the action was either procedurally or substantively unfair, as is the case with unfair dismissal applications. So with that framework in mind, um, to succeed in an adverse action claim, an applicant needs to show, um, and they will need to identify this in their pleadings, firstly, that there is a protection. Now, there are a number of protections under the Fair Work Act. For the purposes of this presentation, we will only look at a workplace right under Section 340, 341, as Penny just mentioned, and also protected attributes under section 351. So these are the two most common ones and that's what we will focus on today. The next thing that will need to be established is adverse action. Um, and that's something Ashley will focus on. And the final element um, so once the applicant establishes the objective facts of the protection and the adverse action, and the claim is consistent with the hypothesis that the and so once the applicant has established the objective facts of the protection and the adverse action and the claim is consistent with the hypothesis that the respondent was actuated by a prescribed purpose once the applicant satisfies those two hurdles the reverse owner's provision in section 361 is triggered and then the onus shifts on the respondent to establish that in fact the reason for the adverse action was not the prescribed purpose but some other purpose. So turning to the first of the protections I mentioned, um, exercise of a workplace right, Section 340 of the Fair Work Act says a person must not take adverse action because another person has a workplace right, ex exercises or has not exercised a workplace right, or proposes or proposes not to exercise a workplace right. Now, person has a workplace right if they are entitled to the benefit of a workplace law or instrument or if they are able to initiate proceedings under a workplace law or instrument. Now the key thing to note is both of those terms are defined very broadly under the legislation. So a workplace law includes all laws which regulate the employment relationship. So it's going to capture not only the Fair Work Act, but also other legislations like anti-discrimination legislation, workplace health and safety legislation, workers' compensation legislation, for example. Similarly, a workplace instrument is defined broadly to include all instruments under, uh, all instruments made under a workplace law. However, one important thing to note, a common law contract is not a workplace instrument. And that's something that can catch people out if they're not aware of that. The, a person also has a workplace right if they're able to make a complaint or inquiry. Now, a complaint and inquiry can generally take two forms. So the first form is where a complaint is made to a body that has the capacity to seek compliance with a workplace law and instrument. So obviously it's going to include um, the Fair Work Commission, the Fair Work Ombudsman and so on. But it may also include organisations um, which are not immediately obvious like the ATO, for example, if you're dealing with um, issues of superannuation. The second situation, and in my experience, it's probably the more common one, which is a complaint of inquiry is made in relation to the employment. 
Now, although section 341 1c says you have to be able to make a complaint, that right to make a complaint need not arise expressly under a statute. And we've got the authority up on the slide, the decision of PIA and King held that general law governing contracts gives you the right to complain about breaches of the contract. And this is something Penny will discuss again in more detail in the second half of the presentation. The other thing to note, a complaint means an expression of grievance or fault. So a complaint, scope of a complaint is quite broad. However, it's not a complaint if you're merely performing what is your role. So the decision of environmental group and Baud, we've got the, um, got the citation on the slide. In that case, it was argued that a CEO making their usual report to the board was a complaint, and that argument was rejected. And the court basically held that the CEO is merely discharging their, um, or the CEO is merely complying with their responsibility. Turning then to the second ground of protection that we will look at today um, is its discrimination. So as well as prohibiting adverse action based on workplace right, the Fair Work Act prohibits um, discrimination on the basis of race, um, sex, sexual orientation, age, and so on. That prohibition is obviously in section 351 of the Act. Now, the key thing to note is it's not enough that the applicant had that particular attribute. The applicant must ultimately prove that the adverse action was taken because of that attribute. So this goes back to the thing that I mentioned right at the start of this presentation, which is in an adverse action claim, the focus of the inquiry is why the adverse action was taken. And it's only if the evidence establishes that the protected attribute was the reason for the adverse action, then a claim is successfully made out. If the protected attribute was merely co coincidental or just simply part of the surrounding circumstances, that's not going to be enough for the applicant to be successful. Now, section 351, two and three, or subsections two and three, expressly pick up the regime of the various anti-discrimination legislation. And as a result, conduct that is prohibited by anti-discrimination legislation will constitute a contravention of section 351 only if it's a contravention of those legislation as well. However, even with that being the case, an adverse action claim under section 351 may often be more attractive to applicants than a claim under the anti-discrimination legislation because of the sorts of things we've got on the slide. So. The applicant can take advantage of the rebuttable presumption. If an officer or an employee of a corporation is acting within their actual or apparent authority, then the corporation is liable. Um, and if the corporation is liable, there are um, pecuniary penalties available, which are prima facie paid to the applicant. So. All of those sorts of considerations make this a more attractive um, avenue for applicants than a claim under the anti-discrimination legislation. So uh, now having thought about those two protections, as I mentioned, the next element we need to think about is adverse action. And I'll now hand over to my colleague Ashley to take you through that. Okay, so as Fahim just um, mentioned, I'll be talking about adverse action, what is and what is not adverse action under the Fair Work Act, and in particular under Part 3.31, the general protection sections. Adverse action in, is defined in Section 342, and specifically in relation to an employer 
um, taking action against an employee, it includes things such as dismissing the employee, injuring the employee in his or her employment, um, altering the position of the employee to their prejudice, or discriminating between employees. Um, there's similar meanings in relation to adverse action which apply for prospective employees, contractors and also officers of um, industrial associations, but inevitably um, the most common area is employer-employee relationships and so that's what we'll focus on today. Dealing with each in turn, I'll just go first to the adverse action in respect of dismissal of employees. Dismissal isn't defined in part 3.1, which is the general protections part of the legislation. It is, however, defined in part 3.2, which relates to unfair dismissal. The recent authorities, which are those set out on the slide, um, including the recent case of Coles Supply Chain and Milford that Penny mentioned earlier, all find that the term dismissal, or the definition of the term dismissal in section 386, also applies to general protections claims under part 3.1. That means um, that definition applies in respect to the context we're currently talking about. And in section 386.1, dismissal is defined as um, the termination at the employer's initiative, or secondly, where an employee is forced to resign um, because of the employer's conduct or where there is no reasonable um, where the employee has no reasonable choice. Now that second category is often referred to as constructive dismissal um, and we'll come to that in a moment. Dealing first uh, with the issue of dismissal of casual employees, which is quite an interesting area of this um, law, under the authorities that existed prior to the current legislation, dismissal doesn't occur where there's no um, obligation to provide further work to an employee. That would obviously apply to casuals. And as the decisions set out there on the screen, particularly Thompson and Big Bert and Clark and Premier Youth Works, both held the employees in those decisions or the subject of those decisions uh, were casual employees and the court found in the facts of those cases that the employee could not insist upon further work. And in those circumstances, there would be no dismissal um, because uh, it's just merely a decision not to offer a re-engagement or further employment um, after the conclusion of the, um, the casual employment period. Um, under the current legislation, there is a, a further provision which assists uh, employers dismissing or not dismissing employ um, casual employees and that is section 386 subsection 2 which provides that they, an employee will not be dismissed if they are employed for a specified period of time, um, a specified task or a specified season. Um, so the Act now makes it very clear that there will be no dismissal of casual employees and rather that's merely the end of their employment term. Now, as Penny mentioned in the opening, there has been a recent decision of Coles Supply Chain and Milford, uh, which has determined that the jurisdictional issues in relation to whether an employee is dismissed, particularly with respect to applications made under section 365, must be made at an early stage and before a matter is referred to conciliation. So where that issue is raised, it has to be dealt with as a jurisdictional issue. Um, Penny will come back to this in more detail later in the presentation, but that is an interesting area for the dismissal of casual employees. Turning then to constructive dismissal, um, which is where, which occurs where an employee is forced to resign, um, that requires an analysis, it's a case by case factual analysis, which will require a, a decision about what actually occurred, and in particular, as the authorities say, whether um, the employer's conduct was the real and effective initiator of the termination. That, however, the courts have held doesn't uh, extend to a situation where an employee is willing and content to resign on the terms which they've negotiated. Um, and that can be sometimes an interesting area um, factually in determining whether there has been a constructive dismissal or a dismissal at all. Turning then to category B of adverse action, which is injury in employment, this is a narrower category than um, than the altering of position of an employee to their prejudice, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, but it includes things such as singling out, um, injuries of a compensable kind, and the deprivation of the immediate, immediate practical incidence of employment. 
Category C, which is the altering of the position of an employee to their prejudice, is a very broad category and is often raised because it is so broad and covers things um, which extend beyond legal rights or legal injury. As the court found in Malar de Vic um, and Vemco, it does not require the infringement of a legal right and it merely requires the alteration which has real or substantial effect rather than something that's merely possible or hypothetical. Um, so where there's an adverse effect on the advantages or benefits that an employee receives, or even where there's just a deterioration in those advantages or benefits, that can constitute um, the altering of the position of an employee to their prejudice. Turning then to some examples of category C, it has been um, argued that it includes things such as the allocation of less favourable shifts, um, um, restructures, disciplinary action, uh, reducing access to employment benefits such as promotions. Um, and interestingly in B there, it also has been held to, in at least one circumstance to extend to the failing to re-employ um, in circumstances where the court found that there was an expectation of future work in that case. That's the case of Employment Advocate and NUW. Finally, in relation to the meaning of adverse action, it also includes where an employer discriminates between employees. Now that doesn't adopt the same meaning as the anti-discrimination legislation. Um, and in fact, the courts have found, found, particularly in the matter of Said and CFMEU, that it extends, it means simply um, the treating of people differently in the same or similar circumstances. So it is relatively broad and as the court found um, in the case of Klein, which is also there on the screen, uh, it also incorporates the notion of indirect discrimination. So it doesn't even require direct discrimination, it extends beyond that as well. Um, I'll just hand over to Penny to deal with the next section. Thank you very much, Ashley and Fahim. We'll look now at the important words because of, uh, which appear throughout part 3.1 and give rise, as I was saying earlier, to the causal nexus that must be demonstrated between the adverse action on the one hand and the prescribed reason on the other hand. And we'll look at how that ties in with the rebuttable presumption under section 361. So, uh, as you no doubt know, the proscribed reason need not be the sole or only reason because of section 360, but it must be, uh, it must comprise a substantial and operative reason, which are um, the formulaic words that were established by the High Court in Board of Bendigo and Barclay some years ago. And there must be more than a temporal connection. And that's very important. Just because two things happen at the same time doesn't mean that they're causally connected. So if the uh, employee, if an employee happens to be terminated at the same time that the employee has raised a complaint or shortly thereafter, that does not mean that the termination of employment can be taken to have occurred because of the making of the complaint. And that was the finding in Miladovic and Vemco, and that was um, a finding based on the application of, of numerous appellate decisions, including, of course, the High Court finding in Barclay and CFMEU and BHP Cole. There are numerous other principles that have been established in relation to the um, rebutting of the presumption and the evidence that is required to do that. It is a fairly onerous um, exercise and direct evidence of the decision maker is generally required to rebut the presumption. And in the absence of direct evidence, it may well be that the presumption is not rebutted. So an express denial, for instance, will not usually suffice. And this is what occurred in the recent decision of Rue Hizitagan and Technology One. There were express denials by um, a range of people in, uh, for, who were witnesses for the respondent, in particular the one decision maker who was the executive chairman. And in that case, Justice Kerr found that that express denial was not sufficient because of the con contradictory surrounding evidence and the uh, documentary evidence and the other facts proven where direct evidence of a decision maker is not given or is not given on the particular issue of the termination of employment, which occurred in the peer decision, peer mortgage services and King, then um, the 
presumption can be found not to be rebutted and when the decision maker does not give evidence at all on any matter the decision uh, the re, the presumption can be found not to have been rebutted and that occurred in cigarette and gift warehouse and Whelan. and of course in that decision um, the judge said that the case cried out for evidence of the relevant corporate actor uh, in terms of the assessment of the evidence, it's uh, an assessment of the state of mind of the decision maker that is necessary, and that's a fairly long established, that principle, but not the unconscious mind. And that was a very important principle that was applied in the recent full court decision in Rumble and HWL and Ebsworth, which we'll have a look at in just a moment. And the court must ask why the action was taken, which is always the central question. The decision maker being aware of various facts or matters does not mean that those were the reasons for the conduct. And again, this was a finding um, or a principle, a principle that was applied in Mladovic and CFMEU Endeavour Coal. Um, and essentially that means just because decision makers did know of things doesn't mean that that was the substantial and operative reason for the decision. And even if it was something that was in the mind of the decision maker, if it was not the substantial, uh, substantial and operative reason, then it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be sufficient uh, to establish that the adverse action occurred because of that reason. And as Fahim was saying earlier, the focus is not on the fairness or otherwise of the employer's conduct. So unlike an unfair dismissal application, the fairness of the decision uh, is not to terminate or otherwise take adverse action is not going to be under scrutiny and it, uh, the decision to terminate may have been for a reason that wouldn't have constituted a valid reason if it was an unfair dismissal case. But all that matters is that it wasn't a prescribed reason. So all that matters is the lawfulness under part 3.1 rather than the fairness of the decision. And if we have a look now at the recent decision of Rumble and HWL Ebsworth. In this case, uh, and people may remember this because it made its way to the media on a number of occasions, in this case the applicant was a solicitor who was engaged by a firm um, who was very senior, he was a partner in another firm, he moved across to HWL Ebsworth with the client which was the Department of Defence, the federal government, and his, uh, he was recruited in order to undertake a review of the Department of Defence. And the review was findings of allegations of bullying and assault and so on and so forth within the Department of Defence. And his job was to review that, um, those findings and the conduct. And in the course of doing that, he criticised the Department of Defence in the media. And this was said to be, or this was said by H.W. Ebsworth to have occurred in breach of H.W. Ebsworth's um, media policy. And the first instance decision found in favour of the employer, and the employer had said that they had not terminated the employment of the applicant because he had expressed his political opinion, which was essentially the basis upon which the case was run. The case was a section 351 case, and the applicant claimed that he'd been terminated because he had expressed his political opinion. But the employer said that he had been terminated because he had refused to comply with the firm's media policy. And at the same time, he was costing the firm the fees that the firm was going to earn from the Department of Defence. He was risking the ongoing fees from that client. And the employer's desire was to eliminate insubordination, eliminate the insubordination which was um, said by the firm to be occurring by the um, failure of the applicant to comply with the media policy. And at first instance that was accepted and um, the majority concluded the same thing and uh, the um, managing partner's evidence, the managing partner was the decision maker in this case and his evidence in the witness box was that he in fact did not mind one way or another uh, about, he said uh, he didn't care one way or another what the political opinion of the applicant was, all he wanted was somebody who would comply with his media policy and not risk the uh, ongoing fees from the Department of Defence. And, the, um, and his evidence was accepted on that. And that was very important. And of course, in this decision, the full court, the full federal court also applied the principle that the unconscious mind of the decision maker is not relevant. 
And the full court said that the applicant could have modified his behaviour by adhering to the media policy and still would have been able to hold and express his political opinion but using means other than the media, just as the unsuccessful employees could have acted differently in each of the trilogy of cases, so that's Barclay, BHP, Cole and Endeavour Cole, while ex exercising their respective workplace rights. So he was perfectly entitled, according to the court and the full court, to hold and express the political opinions, but he just couldn't do it at the same time as failing to comply with the media policy and doing the other things that he was doing. Those were the reasons for the termination. Um, so that's an incredibly important decision for employers because if there are other things going on then that and those are the reasons for the termination of employment then that's the evidence that needs to be adduced the the real the substantive and operative reason for the termination of employment are the, um, that's the evidence that needs to be adduced by the employer in the decision of Pia and King in this case, the applicant was engaged as a CEO of a finance company and the applicant made multiple internal complaints that the finance company had engaged in fraud in issuing loans. And at first instance, um, that evidence was accepted and there was a finding at first inst instance um, that the uh, respondent had engaged in issuing fraudulent loans. Um, at the time that the applicant made the allegations to the director, um, who was in effect the employer to the director. The director foreshadowed terminating the applicant's employment and the employee, the applicant, wrote in an email and a letter that if that happened, then that would constitute a breach of contract and or a breach of the Australian consumer law, uh, or on, alternatively, that already those things had been breached. And uh, at first instance, the applicant was successful in demonstrating that those were complaints he was entitled to make. The full court looked at that more closely, particularly in light of the decision that had been issued in the interim period between the first instance decision and the full court looking at this, which was um, cigarette, um, and, uh, wheel, cigarette and gift warehouse and Whelan. Um, and the full court said that the email and the letter were complaints about a breach of contract in the ACL and complaining about your contract of employment being breached and a breach, a, a, a potential breach of the ACL by the employer, those were complaints that the employee was entitled, was able to make. So that's the words in the legislation. The employee must be able to make. So um, an employee is not able to make any complaint. It has to be a particular kind of complaint and it has to be underpinned by statute so, um, or the general law and um, such as a, a breach of contract um, or a breach of the ACL or a breach of another law that gives rise to a statutory entitlement and statu a statutory employment entitlement. In this case, the decision maker, who was the director, who made the decision to ultimately terminate the applicant employee, he failed to give evidence on this particular point. So he failed to give evidence on the issue of termination. He did give evidence on everything else, but in his affidavit and in the witness box, he failed to give evidence on his state of mind or the reasons for his uh, decision to terminate. And instead he relied upon the termination letter. And the termination letter used the words that the termination occurred, that the reason he was being, the applicant was being terminated was because of the making of demands. And of course, the, at first instance and um, on appeal, the making of demands was held to make, be a, a reference to the complaints, to the email and the letter that was sent by the applicant and therefore the letter failed to discharge the onus. Now very importantly, if an employer um, decision maker is in the witness box giving evidence on other things but declines, doesn't give evidence on the making of the decision and instead relies upon one document. There's no obligation on the applicant um, employ uh, the applicant cross-examiner to, um, to cross-examine that out of the decision maker. So that's something that's really important to bear in mind and there's um, a, a fair bit of law on what the obligations are to cross-examine something out of a witness who simply declines to give evidence on it. If the witnesses decline to give evidence on it, there's no obligation to cross-examine it out of them. So it's very important that the respondent employer decision maker actually gives evidence as to the state of mind, um, his or her state of mind in the decision making process.
uh, on that. Um, and even more importantly, in the full court decision, the full court um, upheld the first instance finding that the employer was entitled to terminate in the manner most beneficial to itself, which means that at the earliest opportunity, the employer would have terminated, well, that means, uh, means that a finding was available to the court that at the earliest opportunity, the employer would have um, would have terminated the employment of the employee in any event. And that's based on the decision of DeFalla and the Fair Work Commission, which we'll have a look at in just a moment. And um, what that means is it's important to adduce any evidence of other things that were going on at the same time. If there's misconduct of the employee and the employer would have used that to terminate the employee's employment in any event, that needs to be in the evidence because then the submission can be made based on that evidence that the employee was going to be terminated in any event within a month, within three months, within six months, in any event, that's what the future economic loss is then going to be capped at. In effect, that's what the future economic loss is going to be at the next available opportunity that the employer would have taken to terminate. And this issue arose in the recent decision of Rue Hizidagan and Technology One. And in this decision, the federal court, it's on appeal already um, to the full federal court, uh, so we'll find out what happens in relation to the numerous findings that were made in this decision. Um, it makes for long reading, it's about 350 pages long. And in this case, there was an award of 5.2, almost $5.2 million in damages, compensation and um, breach of contract damages, and also $47,000 awarded in penalties. One award of $7,000 against the executive chairman who was found to be accessory, an accessory I should say, um, and $40,000 awarded against the corporate employer. But of course, the um, biggest issue for the employer in this case was the $5.2 million award of damages. So in this case, the applicant made seven allegations that he had been bullied and under the workplace policy at the time the applicant was dismissed, his gross income, it was described in the decision as gross income, uh, there may have been other components um, in addition to that that were um, not referred to uh, in this particular component of the sum, but it was $845,000, uh, $845, $128,000 per annum. And Justice Kerr found that the allegations, the seven allegations of bullying, did constitute complaints that the applicant was able to make and uh, applied the decision in Peer and King in doing so, um, and said that the workplace policy, well, this was an implicit finding um, in the decision that the workplace bullying policy was incorporated by reference into the contract of employment that gave rise to the contractual entitlement. So that's a, and, and, and applied Shea number six in doing that. And the um, citation for Shea number six is earlier in the slides. It's Shea and True Energy number six. And that's a fairly important decision that of course is something an applicant has to overcome um, if an applicant is saying that it's a breach of a workplace policy that um, gave rise to a contractual entitlement because um, the workplace policy only in certain circumstances will be found to have been incorporated by reference into the contract of employment. Um, and importantly, in Rue Hizidagan um, and Technology One, the onus was not discharged and there were some fairly lengthy reasons given for that Essentially, the employer, the executive chairman who was found in the decision to be the sole decision maker, he did give evidence and he did give evidence on this point and he denied that the reason for the um, termination of employment was the seven allegations of bullying and in fact the submissions made um, for the respondent was that at the time that he made the decision to terminate, he was not aware, the executive chairman was not aware of the seven allegations of bullying. And so it was said to be that the, um, the employer said the termination decision occurred on the 25th of April 2016 and at that point the executive chairman had not become, had not been made aware of the seven allegations of bull bullying. Because of the um, evidence given by numerous other witnesses in that case on both sides, Justice Kerr in that decision did not accept 
Number one, that the decision was made, the decision to terminate was made then. Justice Kerr found that the decision was made um, about five, four or five weeks later in May 2016, and Justice Kerr also made a finding that by then the executive chairman was fully aware, acutely aware, were the words of Justice Kerr, acutely aware and very interested in, were also the words, the seven allegations of bullying. And the evidence also demonstrated that another employee, very senior employee, along with this senior employee, had said, in effect, to the executive chair, it's him or me, you terminate him or you terminate me. And um, those weren't the exact words used, but that is the effect of what was said. And um, the allegations of bullying were in part against that other senior employee. So the executive chair had to make what appeared from the evidence, the summary of the evidence, to make a difficult decision. And Justice Kerr found that having regard to all of those matters, that the um, complaints were very much in the forefront of the employ of the executive chair's mind. He also did not accept there were credibility findings against um, the uh, executive chair as well. Um, and so, having regard to all of those matters, the rebuttable presumption uh, the the presumption was not rebutted. And um, then there were findings that. Um, there were a range of different kinds of findings in relation to the damages that were awarded. There was an agreement said in the decision to be arrived at between the parties as to the, for, the value of the foregone share options. So the, the employer respondent agreed that if the court found a contravention of the Fair Work Act, which Justice Kerr ultimately did, that the amount of the foregone share options um, was $756,410. And then the breach of contract damages, there was um, an entitlement alleged by the employee um, which was an entitlement to um, a part of the incentives due since 2000, 26 November 2009 as a percentage of the profit before tax of the company. And that was um, based on an earlier, on a variation of the contract which was incorporated by reference, Justice Kerr found, into the contract. And um, the parties, the employer then agreed if that was found to have been breached, that contractual clause was found to have been breached by the court and it was found to be breached, then um, the employer agreed that the amount of $1.59 million was to be awarded on that basis. So there was um, a number of agreements between the parties by the end of the hearing um, in closing submissions that Justice Kerr referred to. and then. Um, in terms of the future economic loss, that was um, based on the $824,569 um, $824, per annum calculated from the date of termination on the 18th of May 2016, which is the date that um, Justice Kerr found that the termination occurred up until the 30th of September 2020. So Justice Kerr found that the, that, um, the applicant would have been employed for more than another four years and awarded future economic loss with um, certain percentages reduced uh, for mitigation and contingencies and did consider the um, the Defala and Fair Work Commission decision in terms of the employer said, well, no, he would have been terminated far earlier. He would have been terminated in any event shortly after the time at which he was terminated anyway, based on the principle in Defala and Fair Work Commission. Um, and the employer is entitled to terminate at the earliest available opportunity and the employer is therefore um, entitled to make the submission that um, future economic loss should be reduced to that very short period of time. And Justice Kerr said that DeFowler and the Fair Work Commission can't be applied to, um, to support a proposition that if someone's being bullied to such an extent um, that the relationship between them has broken down and this was the finding of um, Justice Kerr and this was the submission that was made, essentially the relationship between the um, employee and employer had broken down to such a point that he would have been terminated. And Justice Kerr refused to accept that submission and said that if it had broken down, then that was because of the bullying. And so therefore that um, DeFowler and Fair Work Commission can't be relied upon for that principle. So um, he therefore awarded future economic loss. Um, 
for another four and a half years in the total sum of $2.825 million. So it is a large award of 5.2, almost $5.2 million, but it is a fairly unique set of circumstances in terms of the amount that the employee was earning um, per annum, as well as the share the value of the share options and other um, components that were available to the employee. And now it is under appeal. Um, and looking finally at the recent decision of coal supply chain in Milford, this um, Ashley had referred to, and this is very important. Um, the applicant was engaged in this case as a casual employee in 2010, and he was injured in October 2014 and then his employment was terminated on, in June 2016. And in June 2018, he sought to bring a general protections claim. And of course, that was roughly two years out of time, according to the employer. And the employer ran uh, um, filed an objection in the Fair Work Commission, and the, um, alleging that the um, application was roughly two years out of time. And the Fair Work, and then, the employer also said, and he's also a casual. And so therefore, there was no dismissal. There was simply a, a refusal to engage him further um, on a, another contract. And the um, Fair Work Commission decided the out of time issue, but said that it had no jurisdiction. It, it, it just wasn't permitted to decide whether or not there was a dismissal. And then that, the Coles appealed that decision and it went to the full bench and the full bench said the same thing, applying an earlier um, full bench decision. And the application, and that was the decision of Hewitt and Tapero nominees, a 2013 Fair Work Commission full bench decision. And the, um, the employer, Coles, then sought judicial review of the full bench's decision in the Coles matter and said that the, um, for the Fair Work Commission had an obligation to decide whether or not there was a dismissal and it had that obligation to decide it uh, as soon as that dispute was raised by the employer and the full court in the judicial review said yes unanimously. Um, whether there has been a dismissal under section 365 is a jurisdictional precondition. Um, the word dismissal is used in section 365 um, and, and an applicant can only make an application under section 365 where there has been a dismissal. So if the employer says there has not been one, that's a jurisdictional objection that the employer can file at the point that the application is made. And then the application will have no jurisdiction if the employer is successful. And the full court said that if there are no procedures in place within the Fair Work Commission now to deal with such um, uh, objections being filed and then being heard by the Fair Work Commission, then those rules can be made now under Section 609 of the Fair Work Act. So, uh, and then if the, uh, the full court said if the Fair Work Commission errs on the question of whether there's been a dismissal, then either one of the parties can seek judicial review immediately with the, with the federal court um, or the full court. And um, that was um, a finding that was made. I haven't yet seen any decisions uh, uh, flowing from whether an applicant, oh, oh sorry, a respondent employer has filed a jurisdictional objection yet, although I'm sure those will be coming um, in due course and it would be in likelihood a less expensive process for both parties if that issue is dealt with immediately at the Fair Work Commission stage rather than going to a full hearing and having it decided later. Um, and then if we have a look at some of the historical cases in which compensation and the broad scope of Section 545, which of course is the section under which compensation is awarded, have been considered. So there was um, a few years ago the decision of Cassis and the Republic of Lebanon, and in that decision, the Federal Circuit Court awarded um, future economic loss to the applicant employee up to the age of 65 years because they found that she would have been employed with the Republic of Lebanon um, embassy up until she was 65 years of age, but for the fact that a new manager came on board and started subjecting her to various kinds, of, it was, um, she was subjected, the finding was, uh, to discrimination. And, um, but for that having occurred, the um, Federal Circuit Court said that she would have um, had a reasonable expectation of being employed up to 65 years of age. Um, 
and then there were similar findings in uh, a similar finding in CFMEU and Hale Creek Coal, and we've also had a look at Rue Hizzard again. Um, and there have, of course, been other kinds of decisions, um, and this um, this looks at the application of Defala and the Fair Work Commission. Um, which is the decision in which the principle was established that the employer is entitled to terminate in the earliest, most beneficial way. Well, not established, but applied in that decision. And that decision has been applied in numerous cases since, including in Peer and King, including in um, Kennywell and Atkins, which was a case involving a casual applicant. And the casual applicant was successful in demonstrating um, a breach of part 3.1. But in that case, the employer had conceded that there had been a termination and conceded that it had constituted adverse action. So that's why it didn't arise for consideration in that case. But it did amount to nominal um, compensation in um, Kennewell and Atkins. Um, only two weeks compensation was awarded to the employee. And in Clark and Premier Youth Works for, uh, as well, it was um, said that it's almost impossible for a casual to identify any loss because there's no regular work, there's no expectation of reg regular work. Um, and of course, in terms of demonstrating general damages, there must be a causal connection between the loss and the adverse action, or there must be a causal connection between the loss and the adverse action um, and, the, um, and the actual breach of the act for any loss to be, uh, for any damages to be awarded at all, and mere assertion, for instance, of non-economic loss is usually not, or is not enough. There has to be some evidence to give rise to um, any award of damages, but also in particular for non-economic loss, usually something along the lines of a psychologist report or a psychiatrist report to demonstrate the, um, the non-economic loss that's being asserted. And, Finally, if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask, I think we have a mechanism by which questions can be um, asked through Starleaf. It, it, the raise the hand um, function, I don't know if it, it can be seen from the screen that everybody has in front of them. I hope that it can, or if people can type it in. And if no one has any questions, I will completely understand. <laughs> People probably just want to eat their lunch. Well, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> yes, right. Can, can you hear me from uh, where I'm sitting here? No, I can pick it up, yes. Or should I stand at the lectern? No. Um, Penny, thank you very much for that excellent um, discursion into this area of the law. I suppose I just had a couple of questions around the issue of onus and you mentioned onus in a couple of the slides, and I was just contemplating the more general principles associated with onus, such as uh, the bring and shore standard, the more serious the allegation, the more weighty the evidence is required. Uh, the Jones and Dunkell inference that can arise where a witness is not called, for example, to rebut the presumption that you were talking about earlier. But even perhaps more importantly, um, the decision in commercial union and FERCOM um, in which it was actually said the omission to interrogate or ask a friendly witness uh, about matters was actually even more significant than the Jones and Dunkell, and it was actually um, a, a much uh, more significant or, or greater failure, so that that inference that the evidence simply would not have assisted, um, which is the Jones and Dunkell inference, yes. uh, is actually stronger, where you have, uh, as I think in uh, uh, Pierre, was it, where, they, Pierre where, where the... The relevant witness was called, but didn't actually explain anything and simply pointed to their documents. So that omission of evidence, and I take the point, there's no obligation to cross-examine about it if the witness's witness deposes nothing to it, actually gives rise to a stronger presumption as an evidentiary matter in the context of those general principles of onus and weight. Um, I was just wondering, and I hope I haven't surprised you too much <laughs> by asking this question, but. Are those factors that practitioners, are, are they things practitioners need to be aware of when preparing for cases like this? That where the allegations are serious, weighty evidence is required, witnesses are actually required to direct their attention to it, and those general principles associated with evidence, the strength of evidence, the requirement to call witnesses, 
have to be adhered to? Yes, absolutely. So for employer representatives who are preparing the affidavits and who are preparing the case for the decision maker witnesses, they need to bear in mind that there needs to be direct persuasive evidence on that particular question. If the allegation is that the adverse action was termination of employment, who made the decision and exactly what were, what were the factors taken into account um, in the making of the decision and how can the court find, I mean, if the evidence given is inconsistent with the evidence in other areas of the case, which sometimes doesn't come out until cross-examination, but there needs to be a very um, overarching, a strong understanding of everything that was going on in the workplace. And, and, and these decisions are expensive to run from both sides because of all of this. So, um, and you're absolutely right, that is something that needs to be taken into account. Um, and the Brigginshaw standard comes into play with these kinds of cases. So, for example, if you had an employee who claimed they'd been terminated for making a complaint and the employer said, no, no, I sacked him because I thought he was stealing, the, that allegation of stealing would, would need to be backed up, is it right, not merely by a belief, but by some strong evidence that there had in fact been some form of theft or at least a suspicion of theft uh, that had been occurring. That's right. The mere assertion of it is unlikely to be enough o on its own. So the background evidence, so something that would be helpful exactly would be supporting documentary evidence to show an investigation that went on around the alleged stealing, demonstrated um, findings in relation to the stealing, um, that kind of thing. Anything that can substantiate what else was going on in the workplace that was giving rise to the employer's desire to terminate the person and um, and that it's been consistent with the other evidence of the other witnesses as well. And that sounds a fairly straightforward process and perhaps it is at the, in the preparation of the affidavits, but when you need to be aware of all of the things that were going on so that in cross-examination nothing else comes out to demonstrate, well, in fact, that was a side issue. What was really going on were these complaints. And depending upon what the complaints were about, yes, the Brigginshaw standard then comes in because the court needs to make, oh, and the, the court doesn't necessarily need to make a finding that the, the matters complained of actually occurred, but there is another um, line of law that says that the complaint, the matters complained of do need to, uh, the, the applicant needed to have been making them in good faith. They need to be bona fide complaints made in good faith. And if it was just something made up, then the court is entitled to make that finding. But in amongst all of this, the court may make findings that there had been um, for, uh, bullying going on and, and perhaps the Brigginshaw standard is then um, called into play and that kind of thing. But yes, uh, in Rohizadegan, for instance, Justice Kerr said, even without the rebuttable presumption under Section 361, I would have come to the same conclusion. That's how strong um, his honour found that evidence. Um, and, for instance, in the Peer and King case, at first instance, there was a finding in the Federal Circuit Court by Judge Smith that there had been fraud engaged in, and he made that finding straight out, and it was, um, he made that finding against a finance company worth a lot of money in the middle of the Banking Royal Commission. So there are very strong implications that flow from all of this, um, and it's something to be considered. Uh, uh, there must be direct evidence from the decision maker on the decision to terminate or the decision, whatever decision was made along the way. Because if there isn't and there's a vacuum of evidence, then as you say, the, the, um, an adverse inference can be drawn. There's also the statutory um, rebuttable presumption that is in effect the same, the same thing, essentially. But yes, I hope that answers the question. Well, it certainly answers my question. <laughs> I don't know if there are other, we do? We do have a question? I think I'm, seeing gestures to indicate we do. <coughs> Sarah? Oh, hello, hi there. Um, I just wanted to clarify, in Nicole's case about the jurisdictional objection, um, was the court saying that the jurisdictional objection must be raised at the Fair Work Commission stage and before the conciliation? Um, or, or only that it can be? Only that it can be. Uh, as I read the decision. So there's no procedure set up. Well, there may well be. Um, the full court said that it needed to happen and it read as though it needed to happen very quickly. Um, but because, I mean, there can't be an expectation yet that it must be made, it must be raised then. 
although it's going, it, it would be more difficult as time went on to challenge it from an employer's perspective, uh, especially after the pleadings have been filed. So if an employer files a defence and it's not raised in the defence, it's going to then be more difficult to come back and raise that issue. So in the defence, if the employee doesn't raise, for instance, that there was a, that the, uh, the arrangement was a casual engagement rather than employment, a, a common law employment relationship, that kind of thing gets harder to undo later. Once you've pleaded that particular position, um, the, there'd need to be a reasonably good explanation as to why it wasn't pleaded to start with. If you get to the point of pleadings, if you do get to the court and, and it wasn't raised in the Fair Work Commission, but um, there, there's a series of cases that say that the applicant can, um, after the certificate has been, the, um, the termination certificate's been issued by the Fair Work Commission, the applicant's not bound exactly to what's in that. Later, the applicant can actually add claims to it um, and plead wider than the certificate. So it, the reciprocal would be the case in terms of responding to that for the employer, but it's going to get harder and harder as time goes by, as a matter of practicality, I would have thought, and evidence. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Are there, I think there are no more questions, uh, very understandably. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope everyone can eat their lunch if they haven't already eaten their lunch. And thank you very much for attending remotely. Um, and yes, I will say farewell. Thank you. <laughs>